Good evening, everyone. I wanted to sing for you tonight um, a song that I listened to and just started bawling. Um, here comes the waterworks. <laughs> Today we're celebrating graduation for Katarina and for <laughs> yeah, Tyler. And uh, my daughter finished middle school and she's going to go to high school, so we just realized that we only have four years with her. So I'm going to sing now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As you grow older, changes will come. But from the cradle till this time, you've learned about God's Son. Though you walk a narrow way, many paths you have to take. So when you have a choice to make, you'll know by faith that there is a road home in this journey of life. There is a road home, though you seem to wander in the night when darkness surrounds you. I'll leave the light on to show you the path he walks with you. There is a road home. Gently in loving arms, we carried you. Now that you are almost grown, we know what we must do. We'll walk with you along the way Until we have to let you go And we'll trust and always pray That we've taught you to know That there is a road home In this journey of life There is a road When darkness surrounds you, I'll leave the light on to show you what God has planned for you. There is a road home, though we have to let you go, you will never be alone. We trust that you will know there is a road home.
Tyler Griffiths, of course, graduated from Stockbridge High School and is going off to the National Guard here in September. He's going to be gone. And so you guys pray for him. And Katarina is going to Oglethorpe University, going to be a veterinarian, right? He's going to take care of them kitty cats. Bless her heart. <laughs> they need it. Are you going to be a cat psychologist? No. <laughs> and so we got a little gift uh, from the church to you. This one is for Katarina. It's a Bible with your name on it. So you keep that. That's for you. And uh, Tyler, there's one for you. And before you go, I want, I, would you guys please stand? And I just want to say a prayer for them as they go off and ask God to take care of them in uh, whatever he has for them. So please bow with me and let's pray. Lord, today we just ask you that you might uh, have your hand upon Tyler and Katarina, whatever life has for them. God, we pray that you'd uh, allow them to keep you first and keep their eyes on you. And Lord, you protect uh, Tyler, especially as he goes off to the military. I pray that you'd just uh, put your hand upon him. And the uh, Lord, just bless him and take care of him. And for Katerina, she goes off to school and study. God, please uh, stay with her and uh, be with her and help her to do good in her studies. And Lord, uh, we pray she might uh, get a good education. And God, you just take care of both of them. Let them stay focused on you, put you first. And God, you bless, you lead and guide and direct in their lives. Thank you for their faithfulness so far and their testimonies. I pray you bless them and their families. And God, thank you for what you're going to do in their lives. I do pray in Jesus' name, amen. Give them a hand. All right, go ahead, go back.
the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Open your Bible tonight to, to Matthew chapter 11, not Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 11, and also find Luke chapter 1. I want to read just one verse from Matthew 11 and uh, bring a few thoughts from Luke chapter 1 about Matthew chapter 11. And so please find your place there. Tonight we're going to uh, stay in our series on the family called Home Improvement and uh, want to focus tonight on... We who are parents, we know it's graduation Sunday, and we've honored our graduates, we think about our children tonight, but um, uh, the most important people in the lives of our children are we who are parents. And so we need some help, and we need some instruction, and God's got plenty of that for us tonight. And I want to uh, get right into the message. I have a little bit of an introduction, but I'll skip that just for time's sake. But uh, I read a story this, I think it was last week, I read this story, and it was told by two parents. And here's how the story goes. Uh, they're speaking the, in the story, and they say how they had gotten out of church, and as a result, their home was struggling, their marriage was struggling. As a matter of fact, they decided to separate. And so, praise the Lord, things did work out. They got, their, they got their marriage back together, they got their home back together, they got back in church, and things improved. And the parents in the story talk about, they know the exact moment that things began to turn in their life. And here's what happened. The children were gathered in the oldest boy's room playing like they always did. And uh, they were, as a matter of fact, the parents were headed into the room to break the news to the children that they were separating. And uh, they got to the door of the bedroom and the older brother was leading the other children in prayer like he always did, the parents said. And as they're going in to break the news of their separation, they hear the oldest son, who was 12 years old, pray this. Dear Lord... Give us good parents. They didn't know what was happening. They had no idea, but their prayer was that God would give them good parents. And so, of course, their hearts were touched, and they, uh, they got right with each other. They got right with their children, got right with God, and uh, things were okay. And they got back in marriage, and their marriage was restored. And I thought to myself, uh, would it be awesome for us as parents and our children to have that same prayer? Lord, give us good uh, parents, and those of us who are parents, Lord, let us be good parents. I read an ar another article this week, and the title of this article is called, What Will Our Children Remember in 20 Years? It's written by uh, Pastor Kenny Kuykendall of the Crossroads Baptist Church in Lawrenceville. He preached here last summer on Terrific Tuesday, and is going to preach again here this summer on Terrific Tuesday. He's a friend of mine, and here's what he writes. It's called, What Will Our Children Remember in 20 Years? We work hard at giving our kids stuff. From electronics to the latest style of clothing, we ensure they have the very best we can possibly afford. We can give our children the finest things in life, but there is a good chance that 20 years from now, they'll not remember those particular items. What they will remember is the relationship we developed with, uh, developed with them through the years. And I believe we develop relationships through generosity and through trust. When we are generous in the right areas of child training, our children will be more prone to trust and obey us. Let me ask you how generous you are in a few areas. Twenty years from now, your children will not remember all the gifts, but they will remember all the generosities. Number one, he says this, in twenty years, they will remember the time you gave. Time with our children should be the first on the list of relationship development. Nothing lets your children know you love them more than simply being there for them. Time together lets, you know, uh, lets them know they are important to you and affords the opportunity to share moments that will last forever. There is no doubt this is the greatest weakness in our homes. Number two, in 20 years they will remember the encouragement you gave. Children need to know they can fail without their world coming to an end. 
Too often we place expectations on children and grandchildren that are unfair. Our words should be guarded carefully. Lives have been destroyed and homes have been divided because of unrealistic expectations. Encourage your children when they fail and praise them when they prosper. Number three, in 20 years they will remember the instruction you gave. Children need limitations and boundaries and most of them want it. Rules and guidelines are the means by which we find safety, security, and shelter. When children have no instruction and, and, and no teaching from you, they will find it somewhere else and from someone else, oftentimes, for the negative. Don't try to be their friend. Let their friends be their friends. We must be their parents. And to that I say amen. amen. As parents, we set the atmosphere of our household. Instruction doesn't mean dictatorship. It simply means discipleship. Number four, in 20 years, they will remember the love you gave. You may not be able to give them luxury, but you can give them love. The beauty of love is that it can be experienced regardless of social standing, economic climate, and educational background. The one language everyone understands is the language of love. Don't be afraid to love your children too much. What kind of investment are you making in your children? Listen to this. The iPod, the iPad, and the iPhone will never be as important as the I care and the I love you. Amen. Twenty years from now, what will your children remember about you and their time at home? I pray that we have the same prayer. Lord, help us be good parents. The Bible gives us an example of two very good parents. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were the parents of John the Baptist. And we know the difference John the Baptist made. As a matter of fact, uh, Jesus says in our text tonight that John the Baptist is the greatest person ever born of woman. And can I say, yeah, that's a compliment not coming from Matthew but coming from Jesus. Jesus is the one speaking. Find your place there in Matthew chapter 11, and let me read just one verse to you, then we'll look over in Luke chapter 1. Matthew 11, verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there, hath not been, uh, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now look over in Luke chapter 1. We're going to find about the parents who raised this great uh, young man. Look in verse number 5. I'll read down to verse 16. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were well, well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while, they, while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went up into the temple of the Lord." And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an, uh, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. That's very important in just a little bit. In verse 14, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And look in verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. It's interesting, the angel comes and speaks to Zechariah, the father, and says, You're going to have a son, and he's going to be great. And wouldn't you know in Matthew 11, Jesus uh, knows John the Baptist and says, He is great. He's the greatest. And so what is it about Zechariah and Elizabeth that would allow them to raise a great kid? I want to preach tonight on this subject. Dear Lord, give us good parents. Dear Lord, give us good parents. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight uh, for this testimony of John the Baptist and his parents, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. I pray, God, you may let us take... Uh, Lord, just maybe one or two thoughts tonight and apply them to our hearts, especially those who are parents. 
and a lot, let us take what we hear and just uh, let us use it to be the best parent we can be for, for thy will's honor and glory and for the betterment of our children. So you help us tonight, God. We do pray that you may use this message as a special time in our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the message tonight is for we who are parents, but you who are children, you listen so you know how to pray for your parents. And you who are grandchildren, you listen so you'll know how to pray for your children because they're raising your grandchildren. And uh, we, need, we need to be great. Matthew 11 tells us that John the Baptist is the greatest person ever born of woman. And I don't know about you, but if Jesus Christ says it about you, it's a compliment. It's uh, something good to be said. And in Luke chapter 1, we read about the, the parents of John the Baptist. And so we've come to the conclusion that we know who the parents are, and, and, and God says he's going to be great, and he turns out to be just that, he turns out to be great. We must say that if God's given us the testimony of his parents, and as a result of the parents he had, he was a great child, we must say that the parents had a, had a lot to do with it. So what is it about their parents? What is it about them that, would, uh, that, that was in their hearts, in their lives, that allow them to raise such a great young man? And I thought about this. You know, we have a lot of technology and a lot of those iPhone apps. Uh, but I wish there was, a, there was a computer program or an iPhone app that you, could, that you could click on and you could type in the kind of child you wanted to have. And you could type in what you want him to be when he was 20 or 30 or 40 years old. And you could push the enter button or the download button or the upgrade button. And here would come instructions on how to raise a great child. Well, we find that in our Bible, we have uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and, and they raised that great child. They raised a child who made a difference, a child who, who turned many to the Lord, the Bible tells us that. And so I thought about this word, great. A, a survey was done by several child psychologists, and uh, by the way, they were very liberal child psychologists, and they were asked, how can a parent raise a great child? And so they say, well, what's the, what's the word great mean, these psychologists? And so according to them, uh, here's three of their findings. Uh, uh, to be great means that they must have the same amount of positive attributes as negative attributes. So if your child has some nice attributes, he must also have some mean attributes if he's going to be great. If he's polite, he must also be unpolite. If he's humble, he must also be proud if he's going to be well-rounded. And I thought about this, that makes no sense to me. According to the survey, the second uh, way to be great, it means that they have to be sexually active before graduation to really be great. Don't even get me started on that one. Number three, according to be great, it means that a child must be allowed to experience everything a young person could, and uh, so when he's grown up, he'll be able to cope with those things. And that's one of the most ignorant things I've ever heard. So what that means is this. I must let my kids play with a rattlesnake so he'll know rattlesnakes bite and hurt. Or I must let my kid play in the middle of Interstate 20 so he'll know that when cars hit you, it hurts. And I must let my kid play with the business end of a shotgun so he'll know when you get shot, it hurts. Isn't that silly? That's the thinking of these modern psychologists. For your kid to be great, he must both be mean and nice. He must uh, be active in things he shouldn't be active in. He must be able to experience all the problems in life so he'll know how to handle them. Well, I don't think Zach, Ryan, and Elizabeth were quite that kind of parent. I want to give you tonight real quickly five quick things about these parents and what is it allowed them to give John the chance to be great. First of all, in verse 5 and verse 6 of Luke chapter 1, we read that they were saved by the grace of God. There was in the day of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And the Bible says in verse 6 this about them. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Of all the things our children need, what they need is a mom and dad who are saved by the grace of God, who are righteous, who are right before God. Think about this. Zachary 
Zachariah and Elizabeth, they had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They trusted in the fact that he was going to come and pay for their sin. And without a doubt, they were saved. They were righteous before God in verse 6. That word blameless doesn't mean perfect. It simply means without fault. In other words, nobody in town could look at Zachariah and Elizabeth and say, I saw you at such and such a place, or I can't believe you would do that. You're just a wicked person. They couldn't say that about them because they were blameless. They had good testimonies. They were known in their community and in their families for their faith. They were righteous. They were also right before God. They raised their son John the right way. They wanted him to be different from the rest of the kids, so they raised him different than the rest of the parents did. By the way, if we want our kids to be different, we've got to be a different kind of parent. Think about John the Baptist. Think about how different he was. He ate locust and wild honey. He wore camel skin. He wanted to live in the desert. He wasn't going to win Mr. Personality. He wasn't going to win Mr. Best Dressed Award. He wasn't going to win Student of the Month or the Most Valuable Player. But Jesus Christ called him great. And I wonder how many parents would be embarrassed to have a child like John the Baptist. But look at the difference John the Baptist made. Remember I said this last week. It's more important that we teach our kids how to be godly than to be popular. And it's more important to teach our kids how to be godly than to be trendy. And if we focus so much of our attention on letting our kids fit in and letting our kids be popular and be trendy and be who's who and sacrifice their godliness, then you and I as parents have failed. We need a mom and dad who will be saved by the grace of God and will allow that grace of God control us and do what's right concerning our children. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were saved by the grace of God. Number two, they were serious about the work of God. Look in verse 8 and verse 9. Look at what they're doing. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, in other words, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot or his job was to burn incense uh, when he went into the temple of the Lord. It's interesting that the Bible takes time to tell us they were busy serving in their church. They were serious about the work of God. There's a service going on, and guess where the parents are? They are down at the temple, down at the church. And can I say, it doesn't matter what your responsibility is as a parent here at the church, uh, but whatever it is, your kids need to see you being faithful. Uh, your kids need to see you being serious about the work of God. Uh, they need to know that Sunday is church day. And what happens here at church on Sunday is the most important thing that happens on that day. And if we're going to raise great children for God, we have to have a great commitment to the house of God. Sunday is the Lord's day, and whatever else is happening, we ought to be here. Uh, Mom and Dad should be here, and uh, the, the children should be here. And think about this. It's not a day to catch up on chores. Not a day to wash the car, not a day to sleep in, not a day to cut the grass. It's a day to be in God's house It's because it's church day. Amen. doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you want to do, it doesn't matter what your family wants to do, it doesn't matter what your kids want to do, or what the wife wants you to do, or what your friend wants you to do. All that matters is what God wants you to do. And on Sunday, it's the Lord's day. He wants us being in His house. And believe it or not, our children know if we're serious about the work of God. And how can we expect our kids to grow up and be faithful to the church when they see their mom and dad being flippant about the church? John the Baptist was great because his parents were saved by the grace of God. They were serious about the work of God. Number three, they were surrendered to the will of God. Look in verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Zechariah, the, the dad, uh, fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Look over in verse 57, please, of, of Luke chapter 1. Verse 57. And I want to read down to verse 63. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered. And she brought forth a son. And listen what her neighbors do. 
Her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias, after the name of his father. And the mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. They were surrendered to the will of God in naming their son John. And you say, well, what's so important about that? Well, let me explain. Uh, God gave them their son. And God says, you're going to give him a name. And his name is going to be John. But everybody else, you see, wanted him to be called Zechariah. And uh, so it's interesting that the cousins and the neighbors, they show up at the, at, the, at the party, and they're so happy for her. She's finally had a baby. She's been barren for all these years. And it comes to pass, she's got this cute little bundle of joy, and they bring him gifts na- labeled to Zachariah. And they call him Zachariah because, after all, that's his daddy's name. And they figure if he's going to be a good, a good Jew, he's got to be uh, at least named maybe Zachariah Jr. or little Zach or ZJ or little Z or something like that. Not John. They say, what kind of name is John? And here's what they say. God said, name him John, so we're going to name him John. So what's so significant about that? Well, they went against Jewish tradition. Tradition was very important to the Jews. Tradition said that the firstborn son's name would be the father's name. And so no good Jew would name their son John. No offense, Brother Dave. Uh, John was not a good Jew name. How could anybody name their kid John? They went against Jewish tradition. They also went against peer pressure. People had said this. You know how ladies are. John. They named their son John. Does he look like a John to you? He looks like a Zachariah, not a John. And they'd say something like this, quite possibly. You're going to ruin your kid's self-esteem by calling him John. He's never going to fit in with the kids at school with a name like John. But they went against tradition. They went against peer pressure. And they went against, number three, social demands. You see, they didn't let everybody else determine how they're going to raise their boy. To Zachariah and Elizabeth, the most important thing for their child was the will of God. It didn't matter what tradition said. It didn't matter what their friends and family said. It didn't matter what society said. All that mattered is what God said. And God said, name him John. So they named him John. They were completely surrendered to the will of God, not to the will of others. Let me say this to us who are parents. Why would we bow down to society's expectations for our children and allow them to act like the world or talk like the world or dress like the world or do what other worldly kids when the will of God is for them to be separate from the world? Why would we allow our friends and family to influence uh, what we do with our children? It doesn't matter how cute Aunt Bessie thinks your daughter looks in her little shorty shorts. It doesn't matter how, how, how cool somebody looks in their, with their tattoos and their long hair. Uh, the First Timothy 2.9 says this, says a woman should dress modest, and 1 Corinthians 11.14 says it is a shame to have a long hair. And Leviticus 19.28 says to have markings on the skin is a sin. But society has one uh, expectation of your children, and your family may have one expectation for your children, and tradition's got one expectation for your children, but all that matters is, thus saith the Lord, and what God says to do, we ought to do. Who cares what they say? Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were so surrendered to the will of God that yes, they named him one thing, but they raised him also, thus saith the Lord. They were surrendered to the will of God. Number four, they were submissive to the commands of God. Back in verse 13, let me read a couple more verses. Verse 13, I read that in verse 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness And many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord 
their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the angel speaking. And then here's Zechariah speaking. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, to show thee these uh, glad tidings. And behold, Zechariah, because you don't believe me, and won't obey me, Thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. The angel says, here's how it's going to be, Zechariah. You're going to have a son. You're going to call him John. And at first, Zechariah has got a hard time uh, following the program because he says quite naturally, uh, Lord, I'm old, my wife's old, and she can't have children. But God says something different. God says you're going to have a baby. And he's going to be great. And you're going to raise him for the glory of God. And he's going to lead many people to Christ. He's going to be like the prophet Isaiah. He's going to prepare the way for God. But Zechariah doesn't believe him at first because they're old. And him being a Jew, don't you know he knew the story of Abraham and Sarah? And how at 100 years old they had a baby. And, and, and so he should have had no problem believing God. But he didn't. And as a result in verse 20, he was stricken with dumbness because of his unbelief. God told Zechariah that he was dumb because he failed to believe God. Can I say, when you and I fail to believe God concerning our children, we're dumb. And when we're, we're dumb when we don't believe God in how to, to treat our children. And we're dumb when we don't train our children in the way in which they should go. And we are dumb when we don't bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're dumb when we don't believe God. Here's proof. It doesn't matter what, uh, how much education a person has. If he doesn't follow God, he's dumb. It doesn't matter how much money, how many books they've read, how many programs they've watched. Uh, we are dumb when we don't believe the Lord. It doesn't matter what kind of advice we get from others. We're dumb when we don't believe God. But his dumbness was lifted when he obeyed God. Look over in verse 63 and verse 64 again. Of course, the cousins and the neighbors have already said his name is going to be uh, Zachariah Jr., not John. And uh, verse 63, and uh, 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 Zechariah, who's dumb, can't speak, and he, he's asked for a writing table. And he wrote, saying, his name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue was loosed, and he spake and praised God. Think about this. His unbelief caused his dumbness. But yet his dumbness was lifted when he believed and obeyed. And you know, sooner or later, we parents, we're going to learn that it's important to realize this, that God is always right. And uh, hopefully we'll learn that early enough to where it'll benefit our children. But God tells us how to train our children. God tells us how to raise our children, how to discipline our children, how to correct our children, how to love our children, how to encourage our children. And it would be best for us and them if we'd simply obey the commands of God. He was stricken with dumbness when he failed to believe, and yet his dumbness was lifted when he obeyed God. They were saved by the grace of God. They were serious about the work of God. They were surrendered to the will of God. They were submissive to the commands of God. And finally, number five, they were saturated with the Spirit of God. Look back in verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Look in verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited the redeemed, his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he goes on and on to praise God. Can I say, they were both saturated with the Holy Spirit of God. And can I say this? Being filled with the Spirit as a parent is not normal. 
Very few of even us who are saved allow the Holy Spirit of God to control how we raise our children. Very few of us. And too many parents are too concerned about what somebody else says. And too many parents are too concerned about what the other parents say or what the parents of their friends say or what their sisters say or what their parents say. They're too concerned about all that kind of stuff. And we ought to be concerned about what the Holy Spirit of God says to us and how He leads us to raise our children. So what Zachariah and Elizabeth did, they were filled with the Spirit of God, and it was not normal and also was not optional. Ephesians 5.18 tells us very, very, very simply to be filled with the Spirit. There's no way you and I as parents in this wicked world we live in can raise our kids for the glory of God without the filling of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be successful as parents in 2014 or any time for that matter without the the filling of the Holy Spirit because the responsibility is too great to try to do by ourselves. Think about this. Raising great children requires wisdom and strength and grace that we naturally do not have. It comes by the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Let me say this and I'll be done. Spirit-filled parents won't abuse their children. Spirit-filled parents won't mistreat their children. Spirit-filled parents won't intentionally mislead their children. Being filled with the Spirit of God is not an option. Uh, It won't make us perfect parents. There are no perfect parents. The only perfect child ever was Jesus, and Joseph and Mary were both sinners. So we can't be perfect. Uh, But it will make make it possible for us to be good parents, And great children come from good parents. And so I say to all of us tonight, those of us who are either children or parents or or grandparents, let's pray this prayer together. Lord, give us good parents. Give us good parents. Doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter how much fun our children have. It doesn't matter if our children are able to fit in with the other kids. It doesn't matter if our kids have the latest trends and toys. It will not matter if, if, if we heed the advice of other people concerning our children. When we stand before God, He's going to say, how would you raise your children, for me or for somebody else? You say, but it's impossible to raise children in a wicked society. Zachariah and Elizabeth did it when people were getting their heads cut off just for being saved. Uh, they did it uh, w- without, without all these self-help books and all these blogs and websites. I mean, they didn't even have Facebook to go to. How they raised their children? Thus saith the Lord. That's how they raised their children. They were saved by the grace of God. They were serious about the work of God. They were surrendered to the will of God. They were submissive to the commands of God. And they were saturated with the Spirit of God. And maybe tonight, one of these areas in your life, God spoke to you and said, you know, you need to, be do, be, need to do better in that area. Are you sure tonight you're saved? If you die today, do you know for sure heaven is your home? Doesn't matter what kind of parent you are. If you're not a Christian, you can't raise a child for God's glory. Are you saved tonight? Are you serious about the work of God? Are you surrendered to do the will of God? Whatever God says, are you surrendered to do that concerning your children? No matter if they try to talk you out of it. If they say, no, call him, call him Zechariah, don't call him John. Are you submissive to the commands of God? And are you tonight saturated with the Spirit of God? You may say, well, it's too late for me. My kids are all gone. They're already gone. they got kids of their own. What can I say? you got grandchildren, don't you? And maybe your children are saying, well, you know, I'm going to be a, ch- I'm going to be a parent in maybe 20 years. I've got plenty of time. No, today, dedicate yourself today to be that kind of parent. Say, dear Lord, give us good parents. Please stand, we'll pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a quick minute, we'll be done tonight. But I wonder, maybe tonight God did, in fact, speak to your heart. You who are parents or grandparents or children, maybe tonight God simply spoke to your heart and said you need to respond. You need to respond. Well, the altar is open, so you come tonight if God spoke to you. You come right now as I pray, Lord, I thank you tonight for this message, for this example of uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth and how they raised their child according to thus saith the Lord, not according